Let me just say once more, in case you weren't here this morning, thank you for your partnership together with us. 28 years, Emmanuel Baptist Church has supported the Burke holders and our ministry first in Mexico and now with Editorial EBI. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your prayers. We covet your prayers. Thank you for your faithful support. God has blessed our ministry. And it's a joy to see you again. It's a joy to serve the Lord together. So thank you very much. Let me invite you to open your Bibles with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. While you're locating the passage, let me suggest that the epistle of 2 Timothy presents to us a rich missionary message. Paul, the aged missionary, now in his last days in a prison in Rome, passionately writes to Timothy, his maturing yet struggling spiritual son. Paul's personal instruction is timely for Timothy. What Paul writes under the inspiration of God is exactly what young Timothy needed at this particular moment to withstand the challenges of his day and of his ministry and to finish what God had called him to do. But I would suggest to you that Paul's instruction to Timothy is appropriate for us all. What we're going to see today, again, is specific instruction to Timothy, but I think all of us will see the relevancy of this particular text and its importance in our life and our ministry. Follow along with me, if you will, as I read chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. Paul says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. The husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. Timothy, consider what I say, and the Lord give thee understanding in all things. Father, as we look at this passage of Scripture, remind ourselves again that it is your word, written by inspiration. Father, we realize that your word is quick, it's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It accomplishes the purpose for which you wrote it, both to Timothy and even today, 2,000 years later. We ask that your Holy Spirit would be our instructor this morning. Help us to understand this passage, and I pray that you would help us to put it to use in our life, both helping us to understand better the cause of missions and our need for the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we ask these things. Amen. Amen. The urgent nature of the book is found through Paul's frequent use of the imperative mood. You know what I mean by imperative mood, don't you? Commands. There are at least 25 commands found within these 83 verses giving this book one of the greatest imperative-to-verse ratios in all of Paul's writing. Now, that might sound a little technical, but what I'm saying is Paul is writing with urgency here. And he's telling Timothy, Timothy, these are things that you must do for ministry. We call this one of the pastoral epistles. This was something that Paul wrote to Timothy to help him more effectively in the face of significant challenges, to help him to more effectively communicate God's word. There are three imperatives that I want us to look at briefly this morning. 
We don't have time to look at all 25. There are three that I want to look at. Due to their importance regarding missions, they're often addressed independently. In fact, I'm sure many of you in hearing discussions on missions have heard 2 Timothy 2, 2 repeated over and over and over again. The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. However, it is my intent this morning to focus on the relationship of these three imperatives. Because again, they're important independently, but they're more important when we look at them together. And Paul purposefully put these three imperatives together to give Timothy understanding and to give us understanding in the work of the ministry. So what are they? Let me just list them. First, number one, I'll I'll list all three of them. Number one, consciously look to Christ and his grace for strength to minister. That's the first imperative. Consciously look to Christ and his grace for strength to minister. We'll explain what that means. Number two, confidently prepare faithful men for leadership. Confidently prepare faithful men for leadership. And then number three, courageously follow the path of suffering. Courageously follow the path of suffering. So let's look at this this morning. The pastor told me that I have no time restraints so I can preach as long as I want. I'm joking. So what does Paul mean in chapter, in chapter 2 and verse 1 where he says, or we summarize, consciously look to Christ and his grace to minister. It's ironic to me that of the imperatives found within this section, And even the imperatives found within the book of Timothy, this one is given minor billing. In fact, often when you read imperatives, people will rush by this one to get to the imperative in chapter 2. Yet I would suggest to you that the application of this command in verse 1 is absolutely necessary for the completion of the other two. In fact, it is impossible to complete the other two commands without an understanding of this command. We know that Timothy was in a weakened state. You remember that, in, especially in 1 Timothy? Separated from family and friends. Remember, Timothy was from Lystra. We read that, that uh, section this morning. Timothy was from Lystra. He's separated from his family and friends as a ministry. And he finds himself overwhelmed several years into a contentious ministry. We don't have time to unpack all of the details, but there was squabbling that was going on. There was false teaching that had arisen. It was difficult for Timothy. In fact, you remember in 1 Timothy, Paul told him not to be afraid, but to trust in the gospel. Additionally, the fire in Rome two years earlier had intensified the Neronian persecution of which Paul's imprisonment was an example. So here, his mentor the one that had trained him for ministry, the one that had taught him, the one that he had followed all over Asia Minor learning how to do ministry. This mentor of his was in, in, in a prison in Rome facing impending death as a result of the Neronian persecution. In light of all of that, one can easily imagine Timothy's despair. Timothy was overwhelmed. Timothy was afraid. Timothy was confused. Timothy did not know at times, what to do. I do want you to understand that such discouragement and fear is not uncommon amongst missionaries. You said it so well in your prayer, prayer, Pastor. We are weak in faith, aren't we? We're weak in spirit. You do know that, right? That missionaries are made of flesh and blood. The missionaries face the same challenges that all of you do. The missionaries struggle with doubt at times, struggle with fear. We are told that one in six missionaries return home after their first term. Did you hear that? We send out missionaries. One in six of them only last four years on the field. The overall attrition rate amongst all missionaries is between 5 to 8% annually. 
That means almost 10%, if we take the 8% number, almost 10% of the missionaries that have been sent out are coming back. Of equal concern is the potentially corrosive effect of difficult circumstances for those that do not leave the field. Life on the field is often very hard. I can remember many days during our 10 years in ministry in which Lisa and I and our colleagues were fearful of the conditions. And we weren't living in, a, in an openly hostile place, but it was different. They did things differently than we do. And there were, certain, there were certain customs and cultures that even in presenting the gospel, we had to go against or we didn't understand. So there were times where we were afraid. We were discouraged by our own failures. You go to the mission field with high dreams of what God is going to do through you. And, and often those don't come to fruition. We'll address this a little bit in regard to Ephesians here. Frustrated by the slowness of ministry. We expect thousands of people to come to Christ. Why wouldn't they? That's what we think, right? It's a beautiful gospel. It's a beautiful Christ. Yet very few do. The way is narrow. And we find ourselves also weak in faith. Aren't you embarrassed to admit that? We find that that's true. I read a book recently. It said, everybody today are doubting Thomases. We live in a world in which it's difficult to believe because everything is pushing against us and telling us to not believe. Our situation today is very similar to that of Timothy. Whether we're a ministry or whether we're a layman in the pew, we face the same circumstances as Timothy did. Without minimizing personal responsibility, Paul states here that the only way in which Timothy, the only way in which vocational missionaries and all believers can rise above their own weakness and maintain faithfulness in ministry is through divine enabling. Did you catch that? You can't do it. You can't do it on your own. So that book that I quoted that we published for children just a little while ago, Raising Kids in an I-Can-Do-It World, is so important because we can't do it. We can't live life effectively. We can't serve Christ effectively. We can't obey. We can't trust and obey effectively without the enabling without divine enabling. That's what Paul tells Timothy here. He says, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace. Now perhaps it would be better translated, be being strengthened. Because this is a, this is a passive... We, we, like, you, we don't like to talk grammar, right? <laughs> but there's a difference between an active verb and a passive verb. An active verb are things that we do. A passive verb are things that we are enabled to do. The passive verb here means that we are recipients of the action. We don't accomplish the action. So he's not telling Timothy, Timothy, I want you to dig down deep into your own personal resources. I want you to find the strength to accomplish ministry, and I want you to do it. He's not telling Timothy, toughen up, Timothy. You're a weakling. It's not what he's saying. He's telling Timothy, there is a strength that it's available to you. It's not yours. Be being made strong, Timothy. It communicates confidence in an external, supernatural, strengthening, needed to accomplish ministry. It's also what we call an, uh, a continuous verb. Um, it communicates continuous action. So there is no one-time fulfillment. This is a need for strengthening that is ongoing. Specifically, Timothy was to be strong or to find strength, it says, in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Where does, was he to look for that strength. There's an external strength. There's a supernatural strength that's available to you, Timothy. Be being made strong, what? In the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Now, we're very familiar with this term grace, aren't we? 
Grace means God's goodness through Christ toward those who don't deserve it. Amen. That's why we could describe it. We know that grace is necessary for salvation. All of you can quote with me, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But here is the point. Grace in Christ is also necessary for Christian growth and service. Did you catch that? Grace in Christ is also important for Christian growth and service. I read a book several years ago that illustrated it this way. I thought it was very good. He said, often we're taught the idea that, that um, the gospel is the diving board from which we jump into Christianity. So we place our trust in Christ, then we get into Christianity, and we swim and work as, and work as hard as we can. But he said, really, the gospel is the pool into which we jump, and we go deeper and deeper into the gospel. Do you understand the analogy? That was pretty good for me. So it's not just the diving board. It's not just the starting point. Grace is not just necessary at the starting point of Christianity. And then we get into Christianity and we figure it out ourselves. Grace is the pool into which we jump. And we are called as believers of Jesus Christ, go deeper and deeper and deeper into God's grace and into the gospel for our own enabling. Listen to what Paul has said in these well-known texts. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 9, my, and this is um, a quote from that passage, my grace is sufficient for you. This is God talking. And my strength is made perfect, where? In your weakness. 1 Corinthians 15, 10, by the grace of God, I am what I am. Paul is saying at this point in his ministry, where God has brought me and what God has allowed me to do, it's all by the grace of God. Ephesians 6.10, you're familiar with this passage. Finally, brethren, be strong, how? In the Lord and in the power of his might. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things, how? Through Christ which strengtheneth me. Over and over and over again is this, is this repetition, this message that comes of the importance of the grace of Christ, not just for salvation, but for the Christian experience as well. So with this command, Paul fosters a repetitive deliberation. What does he mean by that? Here's the question I had when I looked at this passage. What does that mean? How in the world can I be strong in the grace of of Christ. This is how I understand it. See if this it makes sense to you. Paul fosters a repetitive deliberation in one's inability. And again, this goes against the grain of, of much of our culture. Because we're taught in our culture, you wake up in the morning and you remind yourself of what you can do. You can do anything that you want to do. And God is gracious to us in that he gives us strength, he gives us mental capacities. There is much that we can do on our own. But when it comes to the important things of life, we really can't. So be, being made strong in the grace of Christ Im, implies a, a repetitive deliberation of one's inability and a constant reflection upon the goodness of God as revealed in Christ. I remind myself that God is, by his grace, through Jesus Christ, given me salvation and he abides within me and his spirit strengthens me and points me to the gospel. There's a conscientious thinking and reflection upon that. And then a conscientious appeal to the power and the process of the gospel. Does that make sense to you? That was a lot. Let me repeat it one more time because I need it again. Paul fosters a, rep a repetitive deliberation upon one's inability, a constant reflection upon the goodness of God as revealed in Christ, and a conscientious appeal to the power and process of the gospel. God, I need your help today. May I fall back upon the gospel. May I fall back upon the truth of God's word because I cannot live a moral life. I cannot obey you. I cannot believe. I cannot trust without you. I rest in you. 
That's really what the verses we read this morning in Psalm 21 were talking about, right? So the songs that we sang this morning, I almost thought, did you guys know what I was going to speak on? Huh? Does it surprise you that Paul gives this command not to a new believer, but to his experienced ministry companion? Ministry had, Timothy had already been in ministry now for years. We would expect, in our mind, to say, Timothy, you should already have this master. But even as a missionary, Timothy didn't. And it reminds me that as a missionary, I don't either. And I would venture to say, as a follower of Christ, neither do you. There's days where we might do it well, but there's other days where we fail. We wake up, we don't think about our own ability, we think about our ability We don't reflect upon Christ. We don't wake up and turn to him purposefully and rest upon his goodness and grace. The truth is that all of us face this temptation to trust in ourselves. Even in ministry, think with me on this. While increased talent, training, and experience may raise my evangelistic and ministerial confidence, it also increases my tendency to trust in myself. Can I give you an example? When we arrived in Mexico, you know, we studied the language for the first year, a year and a half. And I can remember those early days when I, had to, when I preached in Spanish for the first time. I had to read my manuscript. I know that my pronunciation was often bad. I can tell that at times by the snickers in the congregation <laughs> where you said something that you shouldn't. I can remember in those early days just pleading to God at the beginning, God, you have got to do this because it's obvious I can't. But then there's a tendency. As you increase in skill in the language, and as you become more comfortable behind the pulpit, and you understand your people a little bit more, there's a tendency for me to trust in myself and not rest in God's grace. It's probably the same in your life and in your experiences. While you may not stand behind a pulpit teaching a Sunday school class, teaching your children, witnessing to your neighbor, the truth is we need God's grace to accomplish these tasks, no matter what level of experience we have. Jerry Bridges in his work, The Discipline of Grace, calls this preaching the gospel to oneself daily. Have you ever heard that before? You preach the gospel to yourself daily. Well, I already accepted it, certainly. And by grace we are saved. We don't doubt our eternal security. But the truth is we need that grace day by day by day by day. Paul says, conscientiously look to Christ and his grace for his strength to minister. Now, just in case this appeal to draw strength from Christ was unclear to Timothy, Paul follows this teaching with two additional very challenging commands. In verse 2, we see that Paul told Timothy, confidently prepare faithful men for leadership. You know the verse, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many men, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also command was most certainly directed toward the need for indigenous reproductive leadership. We talk about this in in, in missions. Ephesian men were needed who could successfully perpetuate the truth of God's word to ensuing generations, one generation, teaching the next generation, teaching the next generation. Timothy was called to prepare such leaders and then to pass the baton of sound doc, pass to them the baton of sound doctrine. This need for godly leadership is the same, by the way, here in Talmadge, Ohio. What we were called to do in Mexico City in the planting of the church, and and I think I've shared with you before, we started a seminary and we taught men in Mexico. That same challenge is your challenge here in Talmadge, Ohio. Also, it's no different. EBI also is working feverishly to accomplish this. We prepare materials for seminaries and we prepare textbooks for seminaries and and things for pastors as well. 
However, there are significant challenges in accomplishing this. Your pastor could probably say amen to that. If I had time, and I could share with you the challenge that we had in Mexico City as we sought to raise up a national pastor and then as he fell into immorality years after the training and then the need to start all over. What a difficulty. The Ephesian story here provides us with a clear example of how difficult ministry is. Without belaboring the point, there's much that we could say about this, a careful analysis of the Ephesian chronology shows that in spite of a significant, almost continual missionary presence for some 13 years in Ephesus by no less than the Apostle Paul and Timothy that involved a focused emphasis upon leadership training. Did you catch all that? 13 years missionaries had been ministering in Ephesus, in the beginning by themselves, later alongside nationals, by no less than the Apostle Paul himself and Timothy, his protege. Even to this day, 13 years later, the church at Ephesus continued to struggle with doctrinal deviation, internal battles, and a lack of significant leadership. That's why Paul was telling this to Timothy at the end of his ministry. Didn't he tell him this before? Certainly he did. But the accomplishment of this is hard, it's difficult, it takes work. It's discouraging. There are failures. And here is the point. Preparing leaders is not an easy task. It wasn't in Paul's day, and it's not today either. Such a ministry can only be accomplished by a strong dependence upon Christ. Did you catch that? These two verses are glued right together. Timothy, be strong in the Lord. And then immediately, train men. Why did he say those together? Because training men, raising up leadership in the church is difficult, discouraging, hard work. Timothy, the only way it's going to be accomplished is by you resting, resting in the grace of Christ. Trusting that Christ will accomplish his work. He that began a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ. And faithfully preaching and teaching the word of God while you rest upon the spirit and his work in your life. It's the only way that it will be accomplished. And with that, Timothy could confidently prepare men for ministry. Let me jump to three. Imperative three. Paul says in verses three to six, courageously follow the path of suffering. Look with me in verse three. And if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, I'm in the wrong passage. Next page. Thou therefore, Timothy, endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned, except he strive lawfully. The husband then that laboreth, here's examples, must be first partaker of the fruits. Consider what I say, and the Lord give you understanding. That the theme of suffering falls immediately after the command to prepare future leaders accentuates the difficult nature of this ministry. Did you catch that? So right, right in the middle, it's like a sandwich. The meat in the sandwich, Paul is saying, is train faithful men. But that is surrounded by two really important imperatives. One is rest in Christ, and the other is endure suffering. Why? Both of those are necessary for the accomplishment of the task. The fact that we live in a world hostile to Christ and biblical truth makes persecution a possibility for all believers and complicates the task of service. I am not a prophet. But I think we ought to be ready for persecution because I think it's coming. We have been so blessed by God's grace here in the United States to have lived and operated and ministered in an environment in which we have great liberty, 
unrestricted liberty to proclaim the word of God with no complications. The rest of the world has not enjoyed that liberty. I saw on the front you had the magazine of the Christian martyrs. We know that there are men all over the world. Russia. I mean, I've read stories of these men who, who preach the gospel and then end up in prison for decades for standing for truth. At least I had the opportunity several years ago to go to Cuba. I said every place that we preached in Cuba, there was a government agent watching, listening, making sure that we didn't say anything in contradiction to the government. There are great restrictions upon the believers there. Yet in the midst of all of those restrictions, the church is thriving in Cuba. The church is thriving in Russia. I like what church historian Tertullian said, that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. In other words, where there's great persecution, the gospel will flourish. We've not had to experience that. Or maybe it's better to say, we've not had the opportunity to experience that yet. Nobody wants to experience persecution, but in the midst of persecution, it can demonstrate and our faith can grow and flourish. The church in Ephesus was under persecution. We've already mentioned the Neronian persecution as the Roman government began pressing down upon the Christian church and restricting and, 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 and killing Christian believers. History records multiple encourage, uh, occurrences of that. Here Paul commands Timothy to suffer, suffer hardship. And, and, the, and the, verb, the verb is very clear in the Greek language, with him. Paul does not call Timothy to do what he is unwilling to do. Paul is not saying, Timothy, suffer hardship. He's saying, Timothy, suffer hardship with me. Remember where Paul was at this time? Paul was in the Mamertine prison in Rome. Paul was suffering for the cause of Christ. He eventually would lose his life for the gospel. Paul is telling Timothy, I want you to join the fraternity of people who are willing to give their lives for the gospel of Jesus Christ, be willing to suffer courageously, follow the path of suffering. Now, suffering here in the United States, by God's grace, doesn't look like us being thrown into prison and our head being chopped off. There are implications for standing for Christ, are there not? There are implications in sharing the gospel. And we as people of God must be willing to do that. We're not called to suffer alone. We're called to suffer with others. I will say that while all are called to suffer, the task of missions clearly embodies this call as God's people are commanded to leave their comfort zone, to travel to distant lands, to interact with different languages, to proclaim the gospel of Christ in, in a different culture among those who are filled or, or, or covered with spiritual darkness. Many are called to give their life for the gospel of Christ. Missions embody suffering. And I constantly give this appeal as God allows me to as I travel to churches. Would you be willing? Would you be willing to step forward and say, God, I'll go where you send. I'll take the gospel of Jesus Christ to my neighbor, to my state, to my country. I'll take it to a foreign land. Paul employs three metaphors here to illustrate the nature of suffering. Each is, each is worthy of an in-depth study. I'm only going to mention it. You didn't tell me what time I had to stop, but I probably got to stop pretty soon. Paul says here, suffer as a soldier who focuses his entire attention upon the battle around him. Isn't that what soldiers are called to do? If you're not attentive when you're a soldier, when you're in the midst of a battle, you'll get shot, you'll get killed. You won't accomplish your purpose. Focuses have, our soldiers have a, 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 a clear focus. This is my job. This is my mission. So we are called to suffer as a soldier who focuses attention, who gives up some of the pleasures of this world, who says no to certain things because there's a task that we must accomplish. Focuses attention upon the battle as his primary goal is to please his commander-in-chief. This is what my commander calls me to do. 
In verse 5, he gives this idea, suffer as an athlete. Do the necessary training, work hard. Specifically here, it's the idea of keep the rules. Don't bend the rules so that you can win the game. Amen. Don't pursue a shortcut so that you can pass others and win. A, a, a good athlete obeys the rules. He keeps the rules. Verse 5, if a man strive for mastery, yet is he not crowned. He is not awarded unless he does it correctly. Keep the rules. And then in verse 6, suffer as a farmer. Any farmers here? We're talking about farming this morning. Your grand, whose grandfather's a farmer? Because the chicken got his foot stepped on by the cow, right? Suffer as a night and day. Or day and night. Sounds better, doesn't it? It's a farmer who toils day and night and then waits patiently day and night for the harvest. Through all of this, the impetus, this idea that Paul is bringing forth is that the ability to suffer the ability to train men for ministry, the ability to live effectively is found through a dependence upon divine grace. Timothy, be strong. Timothy, be being made strong in the grace of So I ask you this, uh, this morning, do you find yourself discouraged, fearful of others, frustrated in your walk and witness for the Lord? Welcome to the club. <laughs> because we all do. And the truth is, this is this is exactly where God wants us to be so that we can learn to depend completely upon Him and be strengthened by the gospel. Father, I thank you. I thank you that the grace of Christ is sufficient not just to save me, but to change me. I thank you the grace of Christ enables us to accomplish what it is that you call us to do. It's the grace of Christ that brings peace and joy and satisfaction in our lives. It's the grace of Christ that helps us to serve you effectively with patience. Father, I pray that you would teach us, you would help us to depend upon you, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.